Whenever we visit the Indian temples, we are mesmerized by the variety of sculptures on the walls of the temples. On the walls of the temples, we find various gods and goddesses, deities, ganas. We also find different type of creatures, some of them mythical creatures, which normally do not exist in the normal world. In the same temples, we also find images of dwarf-like creatures in most of the ancient Indian temples in great numbers. One has only to look closely and we begin to notice them everywhere, on walls, pillars, ceilings, in the interiors and on the facades, in the scenes on mythological plot and in decorative freezes, etc. Many of these dwarfs are shown at the base of the pillars as if they are trying to bear the entire load of the temple, pillars and the walls. These type of dwarfs are known as Atlantis. These pan-Indian images are common to iconographic programs of the temples of the three most important religions of ancient and early medieval India that is Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism. Often grimacing, these figures seem alien to the sacred space in which they are depicted and these figures raise a lot of questions in our minds. We have summarized the result of many years of study of the various types of dwarfs in the Indian temples including the cave temples of the 5th to 10th century and the early Buddhist monuments and the South Indian architecture of different periods. Dwarfs are anthropomorphic figures with shortened limbs that is arms and legs and a large head which can sometimes be confused with children frolicking and playing. Grimacing and clowning little men sometimes in their games go beyond the norm of the normal depiction. Often they are shown dancing and holding musical instruments. The images may contain various elements, a combination of human and animal features and even combination with plant forms. A very deep study has been done by T. V. G. Shastri in the year 1959 and most of our data we have taken it from Mr. Shastri's work. The dwarfs were also studied by M.A. Dhaka in the year 1964, which was devoted to Bhutas or the, and it contained ideas of several levels regarding the various images. These dwarfs have different names at places they are in the form of Ganas, Bhutas, Parmatha, Yaksha, Bhutgana, Marudgana, Guhayaka, Kumanda, etc. The iconographic program of the temple and consequently its components are always a reflection of many ideas and trends corresponding both to the time period and stage of development of society and to individual perception. It reflects, in addition to religious views, the political aspirations of the people and the features of real life, peculiarities of ideas about the universe and the various cults. The key to the popularity of dwarf characters in the iconographic program of the temple lies in the proportioning system of Indian art, the Talamana, according to which the proportions of the characters depend on the place in the hierarchy that he occupies. The system is expounded in various treatises for sculptors like the Shilpa Shastras. The worship of spirits plays an important role not only in Hinduism but also in Buddhism, Jainism and also. Spirits in Yakshas with Yakshinis as well as Nagas and other demigods were closer to people, having clearer symbols, understandable goals of the worship, the main ones among which were prosperity, wealth, fertility, elimination of adversity, etc. Worship was directed to them on the achievement of real goals, momentary benefits in this life, etc. In the religious literature of Hinduism, the main function of Dwarf is the companions of the deities, his retinue, the army ganas. They can be seen as such in plot scenes of temples and this level can be called mythological depiction. In the Vishnu Dharmottara Puran, ganas, various gods of Shiva are most popular. It is interesting that almost all the spirits known in folklore were assigned to them. In addition to them, ganas, many deities of Vedic mythology, pass into the category of Shiva characteristic. Gana is often attributed a terrifying appearance. They are vividly described in the Puranic literature, especially in the Matasya Puran. Here we find a mention which says that 
Daksha became the founder of the most wonderful race. Among his children were bipedal, some had more legs, some had long ears, some were broad, some had features of a horse, bear, lion, dog, boar or camel. Seeing such a great variety of his offspring, Daksha created a great variety of women. However, there is no such flight of fancy in these images. Basically, the Ganas appear as dwarf-shaped men without any additional deformations, sometimes with zoomorphic heads, less often with additional face on the stomach, the so-called a dwarf with a stomach, a dwarf with a head in the stomach. Among other things, opposing demonic forces are depicted in the form of dwarfs. In Hinduism, Asuras, whose name which means not a god, directly indicates them as antipodes or divine characters. In Buddhism, such dwarfs appear in the retinue of Mara, in the iconography of the temptation of Buddha, and in Jainism also, we find the same thing. Images of dwarfs located at the corner of the stambhas that delimit the mandapa serve as a kind of display of the ritual. Normally, we find in the hands of the ganas, percussion instruments like drums, cymbals, guitars, trappers, flutes, shells, etc. The stone dwarfs placed on the pillars with musical instruments in their hands create eternal music that glorify their master in the main temple. The dwarf in general is a freakish creation of nature. Short hands, short legs and a pot belly are the chief characteristics among the human beings. When relatively viewed with a proportionate body, the dwarf presents a very queer effect. In fact, it is a rare phenomena among human beings. It exists in animals and birds too, which may not be carefully noticed. The dwarf phenomena as observed in nature has been attempted on plastic material as imitations ever since man had started making models. Clay, wood and stone were the mediums on which the early man showed his artistic skills. The earliest plastic representation of dwarf has been found in the Aurignacian period that is 40,000 BC to 20,000 BC. The female divinity Venus of Willendorf picked up from the Austrian Danube Valley is one of the oldest representation of dwarf on terracotta or clay. It can be seen from the various sculptures. It appears that the dwarfs are mostly created to display the artistic effect and incidentally sometimes they are associated with humor. Dwarfish figures carved inside artistic designs are more appealing and presents an excellent relief in the sculpture. In a serious religious topic, if a pot ballet dwarf is shown, as though he is dancing, it stimulates the interest in the original theme. This fancy figure is more or less a compromise between the abstract religious legends and the illustrations of everyday life. It is an attempt to accommodate the orthodox principles of religion with the help of known scenes that appeal to the common men. Nothing gives more pleasure than observing a dwarf raising up a short leg and outstretched hands in the dancing posture. Sometimes different type of peeps are to be introduced to give a realistic effect in the sculpture. A man with proportionate limbs can never fit well in a scene where a man has to be employed to lift a very heavy weight or a load. A hefty man with strong muscles would be apt into the scene. Moreover, the sculptor can give a better realistic effect by making the stomach larger and the legs shorter. Incidentally, his face must be shown with an expression that indicates the weight or the effect of the vertical stress on the head. It is not the organic balance and the beauty that is necessary, but it is the realistic approach of the sculptor in portraying his ideas. The sculptor's ahochitra or the picture in his mind is limited to the plasticity of the medium they have to adhere to certain fundamentals in carving relative to the existing social habit. Sometimes in a court scene, if some people of the royal households are shown, a dwarfish human representation of a typical servant who carries the necessary things for the kings or queens is also included. Sometimes they are shown in a disproportionate manner if it is to be viewed properly. Some of them are purposely made dis disproportionate, probably to overcome the defect of the optical illusion. A huge sculpture certainly looks odd when carefully observed limb by limb in a closer view, but a glance away from it makes it more befitting. Dwarfs at times are used in the sculpture to give more prominence to the main figures. The Dwarpalas or the gatekeepers 
are normally shown with dwarfish human beings by their sides. The giant figures on either side of the entrance alone cannot give a better effect. If a dwarf figure is introduced below the personality of the giant, the doorman's personality gets enhanced. Thus, the dwarf motive is used to give a relative effect. Small dwarf figures are used to fill excess spaces. After depicting the main scene, it is quite likely at times that some of the space is left over. Instead of keeping the space blank, dwarfish figures are introduced. Sometimes they are shown moving in a procession. They are shown playing on instruments. These tiny figures would be filling up the space and the entrance of the decorative gates. Dwarfs are shown as symbolic figures. They speak of some latent idea for which the sculptor would think of giving profound significance. If ferocious dwarfs are seen around a meditating figure, it evidently means that the dwarfs are symbolic forces trying to disturb the man in grim determination. Dwarf represented with a money bag may be taken as Kubera. The next type of dwarf are the carriers and the Atlantis. Dwarfs as carriers of plates and baskets are not very often noticed in sculptures. Only the Buddhist sculptures have given them a fair representation in the stupa slabs. They are normally shown on either side of the shrine chambers with plates on their heads. Sometimes they are shown as Karanda Vihaka, that is the box carriers, carrying small boxes as typical human representation in the royal retinue, particularly in the court scenes. In modern Turkey, near Bugaskoe, there is an ancient Hittiti Sanctuary of Yazilikaya. On the wall of the cliff of the sanctuary, there is a carving of the god of weather, that is sun god, represented as standing over men and animals. This is almost 400 years before the birth of Christ. The reliefs are said to have been carved out. It may be the earliest sculptures where men and animals are shown as vehicles. Later, these vehicles or vahanas have become an important feature whenever gods, goddesses or deities were represented. In the early Buddhist sculptures at Bhatmara, Bharut and Sanchi, several yakshas and yakshis have been carved out standing over human and animal figures. At Bharut, in one of the rail pillars, there is a kubera standing over the shoulders of a dwarf who was shown offering his back. Later, at Mathura, on one of the pillars, there is a yakshi with a caged parrot in her right hand and she is shown over the back of a new dwarf. Much later in South India, symbolically the dwarf is used at the feet of dancing god Nataraja. The dwarf stands for Apasmira Purusha, a symbol of forgetfulness, on whom the god was shown trembling and performing the cosmic dance. Earlier, the same idea was brought about on stones in Pattadakal. In the Virupaksha temple outside the wall Mandapa, there is a niche in which Nataraj is seen with the foot on the back of a dwarf. The Atlantis type of dwarf is very common in the Indian sculptures. They are shown on pillar capitals, on the entrance of stupas, on the tornas and the gateways and on the rail pillars. In some of the western Indian caves, they are shown holding the whole cave on their shoulders. The railing of the Bharut stupa consists of Prasanjit pillar towards the south gate. The dwarfs are seen holding the column at the bottom. They are half seated in a most inconvenient posture. Their two hands are raised up to give an additional support to the column. They do not seem to be worried about the weight on their head. The Atlantis type of dwarfs are superb on the western gateway of Sanchi. It is at this place the sculptors seem to introduce the dwarfs purposely to show the contrast along with wild animals like lions and elephants on the gateways. These dwarfs speak out the skill of the sculptors, though they stand mum bearing the weight of the torna on their heads as they gaze into the space. Each of the eight dwarfs represented on the pillars has an expression of his own. Pleasure and pain in holding the hefty tornas are very well shown on their faces. The stupa number three at Sanchi have dwarfs executed in the same style on the torna. A few sculptures at Amravati have the Atlantis type. In the sculptures of Amravati, Preserved in the Madras Museum, there is the figure of a dwarf holding a Purnagata on the head. As the Purnagata rests on the head, it is held with both hands by the dwarf as though he is giving an additional support. He has put on very serious face to show the determination in him. He is holding the vase full of foliage, the symbol of plenty. He has thick curly hair, probably to cushion the weight of weight over his head. He has permanent bracelets. His earrings are conspicuously shown. He is wearing a scanty cloth enough to go 
round his loins towards the right an extension of the cloth is also shown his navel is prominent it appears that the atlantis shown in the sketch is a specialty of this southern part of india during the 8th century ad in java the representation of the atlantis dwarf was adapted on a stone in barabudur temple next important figures of the dwarfs are the bracket figures very often dwarfs are found as bracket figures on pillars on the purkasa devara on the pillars sometimes they are seen linking up with their hands the ceilings and the pillars both on the top and the bottom the capital of the columns the dwarf bracket figures are noticed sometimes these are seen alone or in couples the earliest representations of the dwarf as a bracket figure is seen at the ananta gufa cave in the khandagiri udaygiri caves of orissa they are shown outside linking up the ceilings and the pillars they are seated on their knees in drooping posture as they support the ceiling with raised hands later at sanchi the bracket figures are very well executed on the torna of sanchi the yakshis in graceful postures are set inside the leaves and flowers but the dwarfs are not shown along with them later in the 6th century ad the chalukyas have introduced the dwarfs along with other features on the columns in cave number 3 at badami the pillars have the reliefs of god shiva and manmatha along with their consorts the couples are shown as bracket figures with dwarfs set in them on some pillars only one lady assisted by a dwarf are shown inside the creepers in the cave number 16 at ajanta we have some very beautifully carved bracket figures of dwarfs pot bellied dwarfs are seen on the columns before the central shrine chamber they are shown with their hands raised up to support the columns carefully examining the ceiling inside the cave chamber as we enter there are dwarf figures in couples most of them are so shown ferocious some of them having swords and daggers in the veranda outside we are seen below the pillar capital similar figures are also found on the stambhas in cave number 23 later at elora these bracket figures were introduced as yakshas paying homage to lord buddha in cave number 12 on the third floor they are seen on either side manusi and dhyani buddha they are shown as though they are offering garlands such dwarfs are seen in the caves at aurangabad and elephanta also in cave number 19 also at ajanta as we enter there are buddhas with dwarfish bracket figures on either side at the top during the 13th century at hoysaleshwara temple at halebadu on one wall fragment six musicians have been portrayed as devotees though they are all dwarfish the panel does not present much humor effect instead it is executed 
more with religious fervor there are some dwarfs in earlier sculptures which are mostly carved out to give a humorous effect the panel of panchika and hariti is the most notable among the gandhara sculptures of the second century below the main panel quite a good number of dwarfs are seen they are tiny fat short and new two of them are engaged in wrestling one dwarf is she is shown over a donkey one is seen pushing it from the behind while the other is in, while the other in front stops its movement there is also another match of dwarfs engaged in wrestling in the 6th century ad at badami the dwarfs were well represented in the space below the main panels in cave number 2 below the cosmic boar there are a number of dwarf figures shown in peculiar posture one is an udarmukha that is a dem that is a dwarf with a face inside his stomach the dwarfs are shown in groups of 3 and 4 engaged in play and dance in the facade of cave number 1 outside there is a dancing shiva towards the extreme right adjoining this there is a panel of dwarfish figures engaged in dance and music here it is evident that the pay, that the vacant space was utilized for decorative figures in cave number 3 there is the figure of vishnu seated over the cosmic snake below there are plenty of tiny dwarfs portrayed as dancing and playing in the mahisasur mardini panel in the same cave dwarfs dwarfs are shown as dancing later in the 16th century humorous representations of the dwarfs are seen on the reliefs of the throne platform at vijayanagara two dwarfs are shown playing on cymbals and the other blowing the pipe both of them are seen in front of a camel evidently they are taking the animal around the people probably to earn out their livelihood very often small figures of seated dwarfs are seen up up the pillars on the four corners somewhere between the base and the capital these are prolific mostly in western indian caves they are normally shown seated on the knees at times the upper half of the pillar consisting of these small figures carved out near the poon ghatta overflowing with foliage both at the madras and the london museum where the amravati sculptures are preserved there are two different slabs which have similar decorations and containing the reliefs of the dwarfs three dancing figures are carved out on them the central dwarf dances by lifting one short leg and the other resting on the ground he takes his uttariya on his outstretched hands he has dignified headdress and a beaded garland the other two are dwarf assistants to him on either side one with a trumpet and other with a drum the buddhist sculptures of andhra have shown the departure of siddhartha only in one specific way whenever they portrayed the scene siddhartha was shown on horseback the hoof of the horse were held by the four dwarf dikpalas lest their sound would disturb the people in the night this evidently means that the dikpala the god themselves are helping siddhartha to go out and find out the cause for suffering of the humanity this idea was copied in brahmanical cave number 14 at elora where the hoofs of nandi the vehicle of shiva were held by dwarf dwarfish figures another common relief in buddhist sculptures where dwarfs were shown was the scene of mara's assault on siddhartha while meditating dwarfish demons on the siddhartha's pedestal under the bodhi tree mara's forces were represented as dwarfs sometimes they were shown with typical horses pig and ferocious human faces typical dwarfs are shown with stretching fist on the pedestal on which there was a figure of siddhartha in the dhyan mudra two bestial looking uncouth demons are shown in an act of attacking they have scanty dress and wear only bracelets both of them are multi tongue projecting out in anger one has a thick beard and the hair stands out erect on the other one one more common scene where dwarfs were shown in buddhist sculptures is that of swet ketu entering the womb of maya the mother of siddhartha the elephant swet ketu was shown descending from heaven in a golden palanquin which was carried by the dwarf yaksha <coughs> dwarfs are seen among anjali karika in the stupa slabs how way up these slabs on either side of the stupa they are shown flying as they play on conches and shells in adoration of lord buddha the above scenes are same in most of the buddhist places in cave number 3 at badami on the left side of the corridor wall there is the image of vishnu sitting over the large cosmic snake below the coils of the snake there is a seated dwarf with his hands raised up in adoration this is pro- probably to represent the dwarfish nature of the devotee relative to the huge cosmic form of lord vishnu at ajanta as we enter the veranda of cave number 2 we notice the entablature on either extremity 
There are lintel slabs over pillared enclosures. The lintel is divided into three columns with dwarf figures on ex extreme ends. They probably represent yakshas. They are pot bellied and have a graceful grilla. They are shown with a bag money. They are shown with a money bag and they may represent kubera. Viewing the Indian sculpture as a whole, it can be observed that both kun gatta and the dwarfs representing Sarkha and Padma are shown in the sculptures as early as 2nd century BC. There are probably symbols used on either side of the entrance of shrine chambers, a symbolic representation for luck. Both of them have frequently used have been used in the sculptures. The idea has probably given rise to the later representation of the Dwarpalas and Dwarpali, sometimes alone and sometimes associated with dwarfs. <coughs> Several technical names have been adopted for the dwarfs in the sculptures, though Vamana is used in general. Yaksha and Ganas appear to be two different names altogether, but in sculpture it may be the same as far as the sculptor's work is concerned. But the meaning it conveys is definitely different. Yaksha is used as a dwarf, sometimes in the class of Rakshasa, whereas Gana is used with reference to Deva. The head of the Yaksha is Kuber, while the head of the Ganas is Ganesha. There are other names like Kubanda, Bharvahaka and Kubja who can be classified into one of the two above. Kumbanda or Kichka or are Bhar Vahakas who are normally used in sculptures as Atlantis. They are thick-set dwarfish type of demons that come under the class of Yakshas. They are employed to hold the architrave of the Torna of a gateway. Kubja and Karand Vahikas can also be classified under Ganas. They are hunchback people with disproportionate legs found in both sexes among the royal retinue. They are short-statured, acting as followers, attendants and assistants. They carry beetle boxes and mirrors and thus help the royal household. Yaksha type of dwarfs come under the supernatural beings who can fly as desire. They belong to the class of demigods who are adored and worshipped as gods themselves, though they are said to have demonic traits. These dwarf yakshas may be man-eating demons. They are gifted with extraordinary power which they utilize to enter the most guarded places. In sculptures, these dwarfs are portrayed as short-statured, corpulent figures. The, ga the great strength of some of these yakshas is clearly portrayed in the representation of dwarfs serving as Atlantis. Dwarfish as well as well-proportioned yakshas who serve as Atlantis are observed in the sculptures of Amravati, Nagarjun Konda and Ghantashala. They have significant headdress, Kundala, Kantahara and Udarbanda. It is evident that the sculptors normally depend on the knowledge of the local traditions, current ideas and the existing literature before they start work on any medium. Observing carefully the sculptors at different places, social practices and customs of that day can easily be inferred. It can also be said that the literature had a strong influence. Recollecting the bronze icon of dancing Shiva over the dwarf Muyalaka, it can be gathered from Puranas that the dwarf is typical representation of forgetfulness. It appears that a magnificent malignant dwarf was created to test the strength of Lord Shiva by a group of vertical rishis, the followers of Mimansa. To confute the rishis, Shiva proceeded to the forest of Tarangana where they were staying. Vishnu took the shape of a beautiful woman. Probably seeing this woman, the rishis were led to dispute and finally their wrath was directed against Shiva. They threatened to kill him by means of incantation. Finally, a tiger was created from the magic fires and it was sent on to Shiva. But the fierce animal was stripped to its skin by the nail of his little finger and used as a garment. Defeated thus in the attempt, the rishis next produced a huge snake which Shiva had as his garland around his neck. Later, they created a malignant dwarf called Apasmara Purusha an embodiment of forgetfulness. When the dwarf rushed against him, Shiva broke his back and got on him and performed the cosmic dance which represent the universe in action. It is evident that the dwarf in this case represents forgetfulness and undesirable qualities among human beings. Yet the back of Apasmara Purusha was purified by the foot of Lord Shiva. Hence, some sanctity is attached to the personality of a dwarf. In Bhagavata Puran, there is a reference of Vishnu who descended to the earth in the form of a Vamana 
a dwarf brahmin in order to crush the giant demon bali mahabali was troubling the gods by conquering all the three worlds indra the chief of the gods approached vishnu to save them from trouble as a dwarf brahmin vishnu went to the king and cunningly carved for 3 feet of his territory on which he could sit and meditate bali who was noted for his charity was astonished to see the dwarf expanding into the universe and occupy the whole earth in one step and the sky in the other step the brahmin then demanded space to keep his third foot in keeping with his promise the king had offered his head on which the god placed his third foot and sent him to the subterranean region of the world thus even vishnu had to take up the form of a dwarf with a motive of relieving the gods of their troubles the parapet walls or on the ceilings generally in the temples and the caves most prominently they are shown along with beautiful Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you.